So my name is Martin Dryden. I'm a clinical researcher located in Munich, and I do have the privilege to coordinate the European MCL network uh, now for over 20 years. So what about Mantosal lymphoma? What kind of disease this is? Well, it's a rare but distinct lymphoma subtype. And it's so uh, what we call the new entities, because it was only introduced about 20 years ago or so. And it's puzzling for most of our clinicians because uh, you have sometimes a more indolent, sometimes a more aggressive course. And that is why it's always dis dis disputable what is the standard of care in Montessori. In younger patients, it becomes a little bit easier because we have quite convincing data that dose intensification per se does improve long-term. So you really gain years of disease-free survival. And that is why we meanwhile also internationally have a generally established standard of care, starting with cytarabine containing induction followed by some kind of dose intensification, uh, namely autologous transfer, and then followed by ritifrin. Now, obviously, this is an approach which is prone for the young fit patients, let's say up to the year 65. So we're missing, to be honest, the majority of patients, but for this one, it's rather safe. We have a lot of experience and High dose chemotherapy does result, as mentioned, in long term responses. So, with this combined triple kind of approach, we achieve median progression free survival rates, well, length about um, eight to 10 years. So, high dose chemotherapy, but also does not result only in high efficacy, but also high toxicity. And that, and that is two parts. The one part is the early myelotoxicity, but we meanwhile know that we also have a delayed toxicity. So yes, we are overcoming the lymphoma, but we buy in, for example, the potential risk of myelodysplasia. So it's always a balance between these two. Therefore, all of us try to get rid of autologous transfer. And that is in fact what triangle trial here being presented in the plenary session at ASH is focusing on. So what is this triangle trial about? We have, this is a huge randomized trial incorporating almost 900 patients. And that's split into three different study arms. One arm, not surprisingly, the standard arm, or now I should call it the old standard arm. And then we have an add-on arm, which is adding ibrutinib to the standard arm. Why ibrutinib? Because uh, ibrutinib has been proven to be the most efficient salvage treatment, at least in early relapses of mantle cell lymphoma, POT24, relapses within 24 months. And that has been now confirmed and is being adapted by doctors worldwide. So the idea was then to take the most efficient salvage treatment to first line. And what about the third arm? That was even more challenging. In the third arm, we thought about the head-to-head -head conversion, autologous transplant versus uh, ibrutinib. So the ibrutinib only arm, we skip autologous transplant. And our hypothesis was autologous transplant is only justified if we see a significant benefit of progression survival. So what about the results of the trial? It's quite maybe not so surprising that the add-on uh, arm, autologous transplant, plus ibrutinib was better than the autologous transplant arm. What is surprising though, that there was a huge difference, that was in the range of 15% of progression to free survival rate after three years only. And I could also add, this is already somehow translating into overall survival 
for statistical reasons why I cannot provide the significance, but I can share with you that there is 5% benefit of overall survival, so you will never catch up with whatever kind of salvage. Even more demanding is the other comparison, which is fibrocinib only versus autologous transplant. And it came by surprise, to be honest, that in fact, autologous transplant was not superior, but more pronounced the flips, the curves flipped around. Essentially, the higher curve of PFS being the ibrotinib only arm and autologous transplant being the inferior comparison arms. And what is even more striking uh, that the ibrotinib arm only was similarly tolerated as the autologous transplant arm. It was skipping, in fact, the acute phase of autologous transplant with a high myeloid toxicity. And we also suspect that we have an improvement of long-term toxicity, although this question will be only answered after follow-up of five to 10 years. The third comparison is an interesting one. And it flips around the question because here we take ibrotinib for granted and ask, if you combine ibrotinib with chemotherapy, is there any benefit of autonomous transplant? And so far, these curves are totally overlapping. They are both significantly better than the old standard autonomous transplant, but here it is where toxicity sits. And we compare these two experimental arms, ibrotinib only versus ibrotinib plus autonomous transplant. And the ibrotinib only arm is significantly better tolerated. And that refers to the acute toxicity, but that also refers to the follow up after autologous transplant. So, to summarize up, if I put all these data together, autologous transplant had been standard of care, it's no more. Both of the Fibrotinib bombs are significantly better. Secondly, toxicity clearly favors the ibrotinib only arm. And I think now we have really a new standard of care with significantly higher efficacy, but also less toxicity to the old standard of autologous transplant. And I think. By that, we really did. This is some kind of a game changer. And that is why it made it to the plenary session, because all of my doctors on both sides of uh, the Atlantic agreed to this conclusion.